what I've seen mostly is fear, mm. right? And and it comes down to um, fear of fear of not knowing what the future will hold, mm. fear of not having a tribe to belong to, fear of not um, measuring up to what one wants to be, fear of living, right? Mm. It just it, being being alive is terrifying. And anything that we can grasp that gives us some semblance, even if it's an illusion of stability, we will we will die for that thing. I'm uh, I'm glad we didn't have uh, time to chat before, so we can keep it, you know, keep it. exactly as it ought to be. But um, I'm eager to see what we end up talking about. Same here. And speaking of which, this is Frank Schaefer, and you are watching and or listening to my podcast and live interview show called In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. And today I'm with Christian Steven, who is a journalist and um, specializes, I guess, in exploring journalism and conflict. And his latest venture is the news and media website, The Signal, which I was just on, by the way, um, and looking at this incredible montage video of, I guess, things you've done around the world in terms of coverage. Do you shoot some of this yourself or are you, do you put together teams of people who go out and collect this um, material? H how much are you on the road doing the journalism part of it? Yeah, that's, it's a good question. So basically I spent the last 10 years as a conflict journalist. So basically on the ground, um, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Gaza, Central Africa, um, and the rest. And so mm, all of it uh, I would be on the ground for. Yeah. But now I'm a little little older, a little wiser. And so starting to build things more than sort of helicopter in and almost get shot. So. Now, now you're in Los Angeles. Um, and what do you do there in terms of the work that you're doing um, with the signal is it out of los angeles or is this sort of all over the place and people working virtually from home or who else involved with that yeah so the signal um was started with uh, myself and a small team and the founder uh, john gould and he um he ran things at the atlantic for almost 10 years mm. and so i was getting to the tail end of you know a long time out in the you know uh heat of a lot of current events and a lot of war and yeah. um, wanted to find something uh, that I could actually pour myself into that wasn't just, you know, um, uh, fight to fight. And mm -hmm. so he and I connected um, and we began this company, which is focused on, you know, liberal democratic values uh, mm -hmm. at a time where, you know, people seem to be losing their minds on both sides and nuanced conversation is in short supply, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, to your, to your question, uh, I'm in the Los Angeles office, which which is my home at this point mm. because of the pandemic. But we're in DC, Toronto. Uh, we've got good people in India, you know, all around the world. So, and where, where do people small... see the material that you put together? So, would this be mostly television, or are you providing uh, information to to print journalists as well, photography, video? Just what's the scope of of the kind of material you're doing? What are you working on? You know, as we speak. Um, and what sort of, where would people be connecting with things you all have done? Sure, absolutely. So uh, the signal itself, I mean, we're a website, we're a publication. And mm -hmm. so it's uh, the sgnl.com. Uh, and that would be, you know, articles uh, every day. Yeah. But our primary sort of product is our newsletter. And so you can sign up for that on the website. You get it uh, on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and on the weekend. And mm. uh, that's what I've spent most of my time doing. So you know, from from helicoptering literally into war zones, I now put together. <laughs> yeah, I now put together newsletters and and uh, the visual uh, side of everything that we do. And so yeah. we're starting there uh, with the editorial side, and then moving uh, into a, a lot of other exciting things, which I can't talk about yet. But we'll see it. Well, we're going to put links to the signal and obviously everything that you want to people who are watching or listening to In Conversation with Frank Schaefer with you today so that um, folks can easily find that, subscribe, get on your 
mailing list, email list, connects with you, uh, like you on Facebook, Twitter, wherever you all have a presence, we'll encourage people to do that. Um, Thank you. Little bit of background. Your that my my podcast interview series recently. I interviewed two people who are in a very similar line of work to yours and have the same kind of trajectory. Fiona Turner, who was the bureau chief for a while, I think for 15 or 17 years for ABC television back a while back in London. And, and she married Gary Knight, who is a, a very well-known um, photographer and has a program in France that teaches journalism to people from developing countries and so forth. They wrote a book, um, which is kind of interesting, called Imagine Reflections on Peace. And it has a, a, a sort of photo essays in it, as well as uh, essays by people who, for instance, negotiated the Irish Peace Accord, people who worked in Botswana, people who have been you know, all over the world, Africa, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, on all sides of the conflict. The reason I bring that up is that um, they came away from that experience wanting to do this book, Imagine Reflections on Peace, and wanting to actually work with younger people who wanted to be journalists, photographers, camera people, and so forth, out of places like Cambodia. They had people shooting uh, pictures on their iPhones in the last repressive cycle in Cambodia, for instance. They were you know, very involved because they knew people on the ground that they had helped train. And my guess is that my friend Gary was trying to sort of get the ringing out of his ears, having done the kind of war correspondence, he's a bit older than you, that you've been doing. Um, he was in Sarajevo, he was in that whole Balkan conflict, very involved with that, the first Iraq conflict and so forth. He came away from that with Fiona saying, okay, for, for chapter two of our lives now, we're going to try to look at all this as a, you know, from a broader perspective and, and I can't say do something about it, but try to put the pieces together on, on conflict resolution and why actual conflict resolution is so rare and look at what makes the, the few places it's actually worked happen. This is a long preamble to come to you and say that kind of philosophically, spiritually uh, matters of the heart, you know, you come out of a, 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 of a line of work that um, besides having a respite and doing this new project out of Los Angeles must leave you asking a lot of philosophical questions about who we are as human beings, because you've seen a lot. And most people read about these things and see them, but you've been there, done that. What's the state, what's the state of the union, as it were, in, in Christian Stevens' brain right now, as in what is this world we live in? What, are, what do people do in it? And, and why all this conflict that you've been looking at and is there a kind of a path towards a better a better resolution to see things or is this just the way things are yeah funny that it's um it's a good way to frame it i, I know gary was out in libya with tim hetherington as well towards the end um yeah. but i don't know i'm i'm becoming more and more uh, aware of paradoxes within our existence uh, mm. as human beings but i think for myself you know i I left home when I was about 15, 16. Hmm. Um, my parents were um, uh, wonderful, but not extremely involved in what I was doing at that age. And so, you know, I was running around um, uh, like a, a little lunatic as it were, but I sort of ran away and then uh, had a friend in the Middle East in Jerusalem and he and I uh, hang out together. And the abridged version is, you know, we got so drunk one night that we ended up on the wrong side of the West Bank and woke mm -hmm. up to the sound of a riot. And, you know, something in my lizard brain, as it were, went towards it instead of away from it and then came back the next day with a camera I borrowed from a friend. Mm -hmm. Borrow is a very loose term. Yeah. Um, and started taking pictures and no one would buy pictures from a 15 year old. So, you know, I was living above um, a falafel cook shop. And so I just gave him the pictures and he sold them for me. So they thought that this 80 year old falafel cook was taking pictures of riots. But the point being is, you know, after that, uh, I got the bug and um, convinced an NGO to take me to Mogadishu, uh, covered 20 days of street fights in, in the city there and Al Shabaab. Um, and from that point, covered every major war um, following that for a decade or so. Who were your um, clients during that time? Who was buying your material and paying, paying your bills, as it were? 
Well, you know, I mean, everybody, right? The... But I mean, how to it, at some point, it's not a 15 year old you were starting to sell your That's own right. material. Well, I started, I started a fake business that accidentally became a real one because people yeah. would people would interact with the company rather than a child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, one thing led to the other. But um, I think one thing that I found was I was searching for a form of masculinity that I had seen in narratives and, and um, myth and storytelling that we grow yeah. up with. And I wanted to, um, having grown up in a religious environment. Which was, um, by the way, just be detail, a little more detailed when you say religious environment. Yeah. So basically, um, my parents uh, started uh, one of the largest global Christian broadcasting um, companies, as it were, called God TV. Yeah. And so okay. I grew up okay. with... Yeah, it was not only the Christian world, but it was the media within the Christian world. So it's sort right. of behind the curtain of the Wizard of Oz. And so yeah. I grew up handling cameras from age nine and seeing behind and how they would calibrate, how people would calibrate worship services to have the right sort of um, song procession to sort of tap into an emotional peak and then bring in the offering. And then I would see the behind the scenes of all the televangelists that were coming through and it's sort of a case of there was such um, bone deep hypocrisy in what was being professed and what was being done. Can I and the way there and ask you a question? The bone deep hypocrisy is, is that why you ran away when you were 15? Did that contribute to it? Or was it other issues of being a teenager and other things? What, what was that point there? And how aware were you that maybe what your parents were doing is something you weren't ready to do for the rest of your life and sign on? <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, that's the thing, you know, it's sort of a succession element in the way of in, in, in the Christian world, you know, if you're the son of people who head up a large operation, you are viewed as the person who will obviously step into that role. Yeah. And I was fortunate that when I was about 12 or 13, uh, I found the comedian Bill Hicks. I started reading Christopher Hitchens. There were all mm -hmm. sorts of bits and bobs and things just didn't quite click for me. Yeah. Um, but for my part, whether be it subconscious or consciously, I knew that what was being sold was not um, it was not it, and I knew that there was something elemental that uh, had to be out there for the human experience mm -hmm. because whatever this shit was, right, was not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. Whatever this was here, I mean, this is. This is a commodity that you sell to the suckers, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I want to sort of preface by saying the production crew, you know, we had a sort of a choice when we were growing up. It was like, do you want to be at the nice table at the restaurant with the televangelists and, you know, the top brass and the management, mm. or do you want to slum it with the production crew? And I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to make teas and coffees. I wanted to lift cable. I wanted to pack up the vans before and after and all of that sort of thing. And, and I was with a group of really wonderful people who genuinely believed in what they were doing. Yeah. Now, that's separate from sort of the, um, the, the, the more sinister um, uh, sort of gleaming sharp teeth uh, and suit and ties at the top. Right. Yeah. And I wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, I like I the gleaming hand. sharp teeth and suit and ties. That's a good description. For someone who was with Pat Robertson five or six times on his uh, 700 Club back in the day, gleaming teeth, yeah, very good. So let me just ask you a question there. Um, what's happened since, we won't dwell on it, but what's happened to God TV and all that stuff now? I've totally lost track. Where is, are they still going? Yeah, God TV is still going. Um, my, my, my parents divorced and, you know, in any other corporate environment, Right. right. Well, it happens. Human beings are human beings. Yeah. But it's sort of a death knell in the Christian community because for all the uh, uh, talk of grace and uh, accommodating and, and loving each other, turns out if you step out of line on what's perceived to be the way things go, yeah, you're, you're shunned by the community, um, which is sort of, you know, you so basically, it's sort of less of a less of a going concern than it was when when did God TV kind because I remember it well, but I can't put I'm very bad on dates. What was the trajectory? So sort of when did it hit its zenith? 
Yeah, Did that so coincide with your teenagerhood? <laughs> so I was born and God TV was started. I get it. Same time. Yeah. And so, you know, basically from, you know, I, I was shot out of the birth canal, you know, into a thresher that we'll call life, right? Yeah. And God TV was the same. And so yeah. with that parallel, it was a third child. I have a sister um, who's incredibly normal and wonderful in every way. Yeah. yeah. Um, she didn't feel the need to go off, you know, and uh, hang out with warlords in order to sort of grasp and gather purchase on, on right. what life could be. But uh, God TV sort of hit its peak when I was, you know, early, early teens, uh, maybe 10 or 11, all of that. And then um, when my parents split up. Um, Which was when? They, well, how old were you? My goodness. It's funny that, you know, I can't actually recall. Sure. I um, get it. But it's a few, it's a few, it's probably six years ago okay uh, all right maybe so five moving forward uh, then then that happened and then after that it sort of tapered off a little bit or, or yeah they, they split up and 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 again they were the sort of uh intensely visible leadership of it and so god TV has passed on to someone else who wants to shepherd so it, steward when, it when were when were you sort of you know a little bit being groomed heir apparent I mean, it must have been pretty young because by 15, you're, you're, you're making it pretty clear you're gone. Did they hope you were going to come back and straighten out, as it were, and do the right thing? Or did they yeah, just give up on well, you? Well, and, and this is the thing, as you're familiar with, which is whenever, whenever somebody goes off and does their thing, mm -hmm. it, it's not it, in the community, it's not perceived as, oh, well, you know, their persona non grata. What it is, is, hey, this is going to be a fucking great story when they come back. Yeah. When they come back, this when he gets up on stage and has a tattoo or two and says, I went out into the wilderness and I came back and trust me, this is it. Yeah. And so the, the whole thing was, you know. Well, that's what Franklin yeah. Graham did because he rebelled and left when he was in his teens. And now he's a right wing leader that probably delivered yeah. Trump the presidency. So he got back on board. This is the thing, which is you go out into the world and you either look around right. and see that you are unprepared to deal with a world within which people didn't grow up like you, hmm. and that going back to the community that you know and having that high position would behoove you much more than starting from scratch in the real world, as it were, yeah. or, or you push forward and try and build something um, of your own um, understanding is it well you realize that while you're telling me this story you're probably talking to the only person in north america who totally gets you right now in terms of this part of your life yeah well very much so well this is the thing it's 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 um it, w when you're within the which i appreciate i should say but when you're within yeah. the christian community yeah great when you're making media within mm -hmm. the christian community you, when you're christian you're isolated from the rest of the world Right. When you're making media for the Christians, you're isolated from the isolated group within the world. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's a very small number yeah. um, of people who, who can uh, have that shorthand of, of how it works. It's, it's sort of a Murdoch, uh, yeah. uh, Rupert Murdoch, but with, with Jesus coming in like a bar of yeah, soap. I mean, when you, when you watch Succession, you totally get it. Totally. Me too. Absolutely. I look at that. I looked at Succession. Uh, you know, when I watched that series, um, I'm waiting for the third season to come out. But when I watched the series, it was basically, oh, yeah, been there, done that. I mean, you, you can transpose almost every part of that series into the life of any sort of either mega church pastor building this in empire with his children, huge Christian personality, authors, televangelists, of course. And then there was my father, Francis Schaefer, Edith Schaefer, my mother getting famous as authors and the brief. I think the difference in my background, perhaps in yours, though I don't want to assume that, was that my mom and dad, actually, until they became well known, were living not only humbly but very, uh, you know, with a lot of integrity. They weren't pocket pocketing a lot of income. Um, even when their books started selling a lot, they plowed it back into their ministry. You know, dad was working on the side of his bed in a rocking chair on a tea tray. Uh, with we never owned a car. My childhood, there wasn't much protein. You know, it was a lot of casseroles served to all these students who were crashing in the Swiss chalets where I was growing up. 
then he got famous, but really that's kind of the end, the last 10, 15 years of his life, all that accelerated and then dad died. It was in that time that of course I jumped in as his nepotistic sidekick did what you didn't do. And then I bailed in my late twenties and early thirties and now I'm pushing 70. So I don't do the math very well, but isn't that 40 years ago, something like that. Great skincare uh, routine. Yeah, but um, during the period when the Schaefers were suddenly this very big deal and were being staying in the Ford White House numerous times, my mom became one of Betty Ford's good friends. We knew the Bush family, the Reagans, blah, 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 blah. Uh, our interface wasn't just with money and corruption and pander and, and selling something to suckers, as you put it. Our interface was with the devolution of the Republican Party into kind of a party of theocracy for white evangelicals, and then the party of Trump, and then a, a nationalist cult that doesn't even resemble even the corrupt version of the evangelical Christianity in the 70s yeah. and 80s. So that mm -hmm. I've seen a kind of a trajectory that goes the whole thing and then off the chart, because of course I wasn't in that and I've become a critic of all that, but I get it. But you know where I stand amazed, I asked you that kind of philosophical question earlier, and we'll get back to that in a minute about your view of the world now having seen a lot of shooting and killing and tragedy. Um, you know, my mind is blown right now because, you know, any ending that I would have written, say, if you'd asked me in 1990 or 2000, how's all this going to end? I would have said, well, the religious right's going to peter out. It's aging. The sort of Fox watching demographic, they're going to die off. You know, we're going to become more of a secular liberal society. Instead of that, we're in the middle of a series of global wars of religion. You have Hindu nationalism in India. You oh, have yeah. Wahhabist Islam has completely overcome the Islamic world in terms of mm -hmm. just influence and money. Um, that doesn't even get into the terrorism. I'm just talking about the religions. You have fundamentalist American Christianity becomes a Trump cult that is genuinely becoming sort of a Christo-fascist movement. Now using the Supreme Court in the name of religious liberty to force evangelical values on sexuality and abortion, these other things onto people, I, I would have never foreseen that. In other words, I just thought it was all gonna peter out and I would become a footnote. My family would be a footnote. I'd just be known for having written a book on my son who was a Marine, a couple of decent novels, some stuff I've done. And here we are talking about this as our past and yet our past is now the present. So what your parents did, what my parents did, the world we in, we were in, you know, is the kind of thing where Rachel Maddow calls you and says, please explain what's going on. I mean, it's of the moment again. And that's yeah. where my head just explodes. Boom. So it's funny. I, I, I have um, I have sort of the opposite. There's a lot to cover there. I think first off the bat, the comment about sort of uh, selling something to suckers, this is very specific to televangelists. Right? Sure. I, one sure. thing that my one thing that I'm actually very grateful for is so my parents with the whole of God TV, the whole uh, time that they were in it, they made sure that they took a salary yeah. that was at the same level as a video editor at God TV. Yeah. Which means that they never took sort of exorbitant amounts of money. They made sure that they, it would always be seen that they would be taking uh, the same salary as uh, whatever it was so that they wouldn't run into all of that. But the yeah. thing is, when you're surrounding, uh, surrounded by all of the televangelists and all that sort of thing, it's very yeah. hard to retain your integrity and they were able to do that which i'm i'm impressed after the fact by but when you're in it it's hard to sort of pass out what's you know uh completely grotesque as it were and what is integrity even in the midst of something that is false um yeah so but this is the other thing right if you had put to me what is happening now mm. i would have said that makes perfect sense. Mm. Now, maybe it's a difference in the decades, but what I noticed was, you know, when you've got an apocalyptic death cult, yes, right, turns out that this is, if you go to a crusade of any kind and you look into the face of somebody who is fully within that moment that they mm. are having, what you're seeing is the moment before crusaders yell, God wills it and go and massacre, a, you know, a, yeah. a Saracen camp. And yeah. so it really comes down to the thing of with, with a mythological 
culture and a culture built on storytelling. Hmm. When you add something to that, which can be, this world is not real. This is a story that you are, you and Jesus are in relationship and you are the main character and Mm -hmm. you'll rule and reign with him for a thousand years and all that sort of thing. But don't worry about this because this is just, you know, this is the, the, the preamble. This is the opening. This is the appetizer for what Mm -hmm. actually comes next. So your only focus while you're on this planet is to make sure that you get what you need in order to get the right placement when Mm -hmm. the actual world comes to be yeah the one you're going to be in forever and so it comes down to a place of when you add social media to this when you add mass uh communication to this when you have echo chambers and uh in many ways a visualization chamber it's just the feedback loop Mm -hmm. of of confirmation bias of i want this to be true well guess what the algorithm is going to give you everything you need to Mm -hmm. never get out of that thought pattern. Not Mm -hmm. only that, but it's going to reinforce it. And guess what? The algorithm is going to bring you people who also think that thing and bop, 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 bop. And suddenly you've got a very dense worldview that is skewed in many ways. And this is the thing of when you look at QAnon, the question people have the most is how do I reach and how do I get people out of it? Hmm. There is to have agency within that moment of of trying to reach someone in a way that's not um, accusatory, yeah, and that isn't sort of I know that you're crazy, and so I'm going to tell you why you are and how you need to sort of get out of that. But it doesn't work. It's not. It's not how human beings function. Yeah, and so what we have now is we have social media giants basically pouring gasoline onto magical thinking that is now weaponized politically. Mm. And this, this combination here is, is very much, um, if you look at it the right way in an eschatological, right, the study of the end times sure. uh, viewpoint, uh, every time that you put forward something um, it is going to fit in to the plan yeah. of how this is all supposed to end. And so yeah. you've got people pulling their hair out going, these people are crazy. How do we stop this? And it's sort yeah. of whatever you say is going to be spun slightly and fit yeah. perfectly into the narrative of, well, you would say that because mm-hmm. you're trying to sway me from the path. And yeah. therefore, every time you interact with me and tell me that, I get deeper into it. Which so this is some, of, yeah. One of the reasons that Trump's whole thing about fake news fits so well with those white evangelical audience because they've been seeing the whole world that way. Whether it's the evolutionary biology they're taught in primary school and high school is fake because that's not in the Bible. Climate change, and or flip it, you know, in a kind of uh, uh, when it comes to actions into the world, you know, putting on the checklist of what Trump was supposed to do, which was to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. To, to, to help the rapture come quicker and Jesus' return come quicker because it's part of the fulfillment of prophecy, not the, the, the pro-Israel uh, American Zionist evangelical is not interested in Israel as Israel any more than he or she is interested in this moment in the way you said it. It's always that future story, which means that it doesn't matter if it's terrible policy now and, and creates a horrible situation. It's all part of the plan. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was a perfect match. Um, the whole, whole thing. part of the planet, if, and if I may, it's, it's very much the case of people will see, let's take the embassy move, for example. Yeah. You'll see them moving the embassy and sort of go, well, he wants to do that because he thinks it's the right thing. No, mm. he wants to do that because he has had a group of experts yeah. in the room next to the Oval Office say, hey, to get that section of the vote, yeah. You need to do this because that's what they want because of this story over here. Therefore, he's going to do it yeah. to get votes. It is not fulfillment of prophecy. Yeah. What it is, is it's, it's excellent electioneering. Yeah. And so it, this is the thing. You don't want to hear that you know, your story, that your entire worldview and existence is based on is actually being calibrated 
yeah. for votes and political Well, basically sold, sold back to you. You know, it's the Soylent Green thing where, you know, they're, you're, the body, that the, <laughs> the state's reprocessing your own body and selling it back to you as food. And I mean, Trump, of course, went it a mile further than most political leaders who have some sense of a worldview or some principle or line they won't cross. And there was none with him. So when Ralph Reed and Franklin Graham and Jerry Falwell Jr. went to him and said, here's our checklist. You don't have a ground game, but Hillary does. And if you will deliver on these things, these justices from the Federalist Society, move the embassy, do this, this, and this, talk about transgender people this way, talk about abortion this way, we can deliver for you. And they did. Yeah. And, and it, it worked very well. Let me just remind people you're watching and or listening to my podcast in conversation with Frank Schaefer today. I'm talking with journalist, photographer, uh, videographer, news person, commentator, philosopher, uh, one time perhaps leader of a Christian group who then fled very much like I did from my background, um, Christian Stephen. Uh, so in the newsletter that you're doing, The Signal, and the other reporting you're doing, do you pay a little bit of special attention to this kind of insider knowledge that you bring from that kind of evangelical past? Or are you looking, you know, would you be classified more in terms of your interests of war and peace issues, uh, global conflict and this kind of thing? How much of your own background and family history bleeds into what you're doing now? It's interesting, uh, none, and, okay. and I'll explain. Uh, it's sort of a case of, I often find that people who, people who, this is one of the first times I've spoken about, you know, my family history, right? Yeah. It may actually be the first in a public forum. And so it's very much the case of, my fear was always that if you mention that sort of odd part of your life, then you're that person. Yeah. Right? And so for me, you know, um, I've been shot at, tortured, you know, captured, uh, created documentaries, um, and traveled around the world. And I, I almost refuse in many ways to, to be classified as the person who, you know, had parents who did X, Y, and Z, yeah, sure. you know, and it, it, there's not in a case of sort of, well, I've done amazing things. I want to be seen for these amazing things. Yeah. It's much more a case of, I'm trying to find a fundamental truth about how we live. Mm. and who we are as we inhabit this moment in existence. Yeah. And that, that search and, and that striving for something resembling a truth is so much more important than, you know, the, um, the machinations and, and sort of uh, <sighs> manipulations of a certain subset of mm. televangelists, as it were. Yeah. Because I think people are better, are worth more than that, yeah. and I think I think what it comes down to to take it to just something else that's related but separate in many ways is what I've seen mostly is fear, hmm. right? And and it comes down to um, fear of fear of not knowing what the future will hold, hmm. fear of not having a tribe to belong to, fear of not um, measuring up to what one wants to be, fear of living, right? Mm -hmm. it just it, being being alive is terrifying. And mm -hmm. anything that we can grasp that gives us some semblance, even if it's an illusion of stability, we will, we will die for that thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think for my part, moving into a place of just pure fear and being able to sit with it, mm -hmm. um, that taught me more about religion than any sort of anti-religious book or any sort of athe sure. atheistic philosophy or anything like that. I think being able to, to search out fear and sit with it hmm. in a way that's not sort of, I will conquer you, but just being with it and trying to understand the, the texture of fear, as hmm. it were, th this is much more, this is much more of a, um, a uh, helpful element in, in trying to reconcile a religious past and, yeah. and an unknown present, if that makes sense. Yeah, a lot of sense. And, you know, my, my past was a little different in the sense that I actually collaborated with my parents and in a way now look back, well, not in a way, I look back with great 
regret and feeling somewhat guilty mm -hmm. um, because my youthful ambition and early years of striving were the thing that pushed my dad in a direction that got him into a position where now his reputation is that uh, of one of the founders of the religious right. Whereas up until he got involved with my film projects, how should we then live them? Whatever happened to the human race, mm -hmm. the books that came out of that. And then his last book, the Christian manifesto, you could take or leave his theology and philosophy and buy it or not buy it. Um, but you'd never close the last page of a book like The God Who Is There and say, this is political, he's right wing. In fact, if you read Escape from Reason and his views of philosophy, or you read his book uh, on ecology, um, Pollution and the Death of Man, published in the 70s, by the way, before anybody was talking about it, you would have thought he was of the left, not of the far left, but of the left. He would have been seen as a liberal when it came to those sorts of things. And of course, because of my ambition of getting him into a much more high powered media uh, form with these film series we did and then the success of the first one and the fact we talked all these evangelicals into taking an anti-abortion stand essentially you know he was a grown-up and went along so it isn't all my fault but had I not been part of the picture had he not been trying to help his young son who had gotten a girl pregnant now had two children and was a painter and trying to find his way but going to make these movies as well his reputation now uh, would be uh, for someone who had been an evangelical intellectual, interested in art and philosophy, a little bit obscure, starting to be forgotten, but no one would look at the Trump years and say there's a direct line from a Christian manifesto and the million people who wrote it, and Francis Schaeffer to Trump and his followers, um, you know, on January 6th, essentially try launching an insurrection. And now they, they can legitimately do that. I'm not saying it's all my fault, but I'm saying the ambitions of his young son. Now, mm -hmm. The other point of view would be, well, he folded me into the project as in, you know, that's his responsibility, but I have a lot of regret there. So that my, my departure was a lot more than yours, is less personal in that I played a part in the project. I have some explaining to do. And so I did the same thing you did. And when I left the evangelical community, I went as far away as I could in the sense that when I was a child, we weren't even allowed to go to movies. So it's no coincidence that I wound up in Hollywood making, directing four low budget films. Uh, and they're not very good movies, but that in my head for my evangelical childhood, you couldn't, you know, other than being a drug dealer or a prostitute, you couldn't get further away from God's plan for your life as a fundamentalist Christian in the 1950s, than go to Hollywood and make quote secular movies. So. It, I look back on the psychology of that, and obviously it was part of my flight. I was lucky. I wrote a novel, Portofino, that did well and gave me permission to be taken seriously as a writer by people who had never heard of Francis Schaeffer all over the world. And um, the Calvin Becker trilogy did very well. And then I've, I wrote a book on my son in the Marine Corps, and that got picked up by all kinds of people uh, who had never heard of the novels. Um, in my 50s, I wrote a memoir called Crazy for God and decided to just try to actually tell that story. But it was after having established myself as a writer with a lot of people who had never heard of Frank Schaefer, this guy who worked with his dad as Frank Schaefer. Um, so there was, a, there was a passage there. But I don't know whether I, I've spent that much time trying to distance myself from that past, but having embraced trying to tell that story in a way to salvage my dad's reputation, in another way to basically try to undo some of the damage. And that as a writer who always folds whatever's going on in my life, growing up as an evangelical is folded into Portofino. You don't know it's Francis Anita Schaefer, but I use that background because I grew up in Switzerland. We used to vacation in Italy. It's biographical. Um, that's natural for writers to do that. When I hit my mid fifties, I decided to not try to write anything but a memoir about that earlier part of my life. And so I wrote Crazy for God. Well, after that, the cat was out of the bag. And then the kind of people who sell news are always looking for a quote, news hook. And a guy that's written a novel about a coming of age story of an 11 year old in Switzerland who goes on vacation to Italy, it, that's not sexy news, but somebody who was attached to the religious right that now is part of a new power structure, we wanna know about that. Yeah. So I have a choice, either disappear or try to explain and undo some of the damage. And I've chosen to try to explain and undo some of the damage. 
It's interesting that it's almost sort of a sins of the son passing to the father in a reverse, you know, if you look at the yeah. ambition. But I think, I think to that point, it, it's interesting the way you frame it. Um, this is probably a conversation for if we can have dinner sometime, but, but, but I'll do a little of it in the way of, I, I feel what has come to pass would have happened by hook or by crook, mm. whether you and your father were involved or not. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. And I think to, to that point, I, I won't try and do the work of, of getting you to not take that upon yourself. You'll do that already. Mm-hmm. But, but I can't help but think, you know, at that age, you know, there's so much ambition that it could burn a hole in your stomach, right? Yeah. It goes back to the fear element. It's the mm-hmm. fear of sort of how will I make a mark on the world? How, what can I use to sort of find my place here? And that was what was in front of you at that time. Yeah, and, and with, more so, by the way, just filling in, speaking about you and me share something, because at 15, I ran away from the British private school, which in England they call public schools for the old, older high school age kids in North Wales, I did know St. David's, and I just, I took off and made it all the way to Holland without a passport <laughs> at 15. Okay, so then my parents started homeschooling me again, and they had tutors and so forth. I walked away from my childhood and adolescence without one single piece of paper or qualification. Same. And I was a prodigious artist. I had a couple of art shows. So not only was I, not only did I face the sort of fear and anxiety of trying to, you know, what am I going to do in the world? It's like, there is no plan B because all I know how to do is be an evangelical leader. And now I'm walking away from that. Um, there is, and, I, and I have three children and a wife. There yeah. is no fallback position. So, you know, there was more cash on the book table at our seminar in Dallas, say, with 25,000 people in the arena on any given night that were buying my dad's books and our products and the tapes than probably was ever in our bank account again for the next 20 years. In other words, I went from, you know, flying around Jerry Falwell's jet and sort of like the mafia, you know, I need some money. Well, how much do you want? I need this much, you know, to literally living in a one room um, apartment on Hollywood Boulevard, looking for work, unable to eat more than one meal a day because all the money in our family was needed by my wife back home with Jessica Francis and, Mm -hmm. and John. So not only did I, did everything just stop, I hit an absolute brick wall. Mm -hmm. And at that period, you talk about this guy coming back on stage, you know, the repentance, you know, I was at any moment, I was a phone call away from calling Pat Robertson or someone saying, I made a terrible mistake. I've heard the Lord has spoken to me. I've sinned. Uh, You know, I'm coming back with this story and so forth. And it was very tempting to do that, but I didn't go there. Mm -hmm. But so my panic and fear was not just theoretical. It was actually for about 10 years. How do we pay for medical insurance? You know, what do I do with these three kids of mine? You know, how do we feed them and send them to school and do all this yeah. stuff? And then, of course, because my writing did OK, um, not great, but OK, um, I, we dug our way out. So it was, you know, by the time I was trying to tell my own story in the memoir, say, 20 years into that process as an older man than I had been, you know, when I left, much older, um, it was like telling someone else's story. In other words, there was so much distance at that point, you know, four feature film. I mean, I didn't get shot at and tortured, but, you know, movie sets all over the world, South Africa and so forth, all this. That's close. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, now I almost feel like when I'm talking about it, that I'm talking to you about someone else's story. Mm-hmm. But I, mean, I think I've got shit around my house that reminds me that it was actually us, but it doesn't feel like me anymore. It's, it, it's interesting that I think, and I'll speak freely here, I, I think from my view, I think you carry upon yourself much of the weight of, you know, Carl, Carl Jung basically said, you know, that the heaviest burden we carry is, uh, we carry the un, unlived dreams of our parents, yeah. right? And, and that can be true in many ways, but I think mm-hmm. there's also something to there are there's a large number of people who would have had that moment where they could have picked up the phone and gone back into the fold and things would have been all right many people have done that Mm. and so it really comes down to a place of you hold regret for the role your family played there 
but I can't help but but want to stand in the middle of that and be able to sort of put forward that by not doing that, you earn the right mm. to have your own life reclaimed. And, and I'll, I'll frame it a different way. Mm. By living through that difficulty, you absolve yourself in many ways because it becomes a case of like, you can carry that weight as long as you want, but no one's actually putting it on you. Mm -hmm. And it is not in many ways yours to carry. Sometimes you do it because it feels good. Mm -hmm. My tooth hurts. I'm going to keep. Right. I'm going to keep touching it. it. It's keep sort of like it. this, this thing where I get to talk about how I was involved in this thing yeah. that was detrimental to the planet. It feels good to self-flagellate. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because hey, I get to sort of tell myself I'm the piece of shit that I suspect I am. Yeah. But this is not, but this is not truth. And so it comes down to a, a point of at what point do you get over yourself? Mm -hmm. And I'll qualify that by sort of going, at what point do you sort of allow yourself some semblance of happiness? Mm. Because when you're raised in an environment where you're born sick, commanded to be well, mm. rest in peace, Christopher Hitchens, right? Yeah. But it's very much the case of you're born sick, commanded to be well. Mm -hmm. Everything good within you comes from God. Mm -hmm. Everything negative about you comes Jesus from yourself yeah. Yeah. and you, you, you have no ownership of anything that is positive. And so for that moment mm -hmm. where you're struggling and there's no money and you, you are one phone call away from going back into the fold and being right. absolutely fine to resist that mm -hmm. is to earn the right to have a life, but not only a life, but you earn the right mm -hmm. to look yourself in the eye in a mirror and actually like, who you see and not in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A moment back ago when we were, I don't know if we were talking in public or not, or whether it was just a couple seconds before we went into this, but I said, you're in Los Angeles and <clears throat> you married somebody from the States. And so that's one reason you're in LA and you use the words. I'm very lucky about marrying the person you're marrying. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I feel the same because, of course, I was I was very fortunate in that um, my real passage out, not of the evangelical world, but out of my own head, in every sense of the word, ambitions, stupid striving, all these other things, began with the fact that, you know, this beautiful San Francisco hippie princess walked into the breed Jeannie Schaefer. We're still together 52 years later. I mean, what are the odds? You know what I'm talking about? Um, the odds are where you make them. Yeah, where we love each other. And I spend most of my days these days taking care of my three youngest grandchildren and writing about them in the new book that's coming out this, this uh, uh, November 2nd, um, a project I've been working on five and a half years, trying to explain why it is I found more pleasure in ordinary, and of course it's extraordinary, human connection than in any of the ambition or career, mm -hmm. any of the writing. Yeah. You know, I, I, as a guy with no college degree who dropped out of everything to get invited to the Kennedy School of Government to give a, le to give a lecture, which I've had done, and to Yale, all these places, because they're curious about various parts of my life. That, by the way, was military family stuff because of that military book I wrote with my son. But, um, you know, there's a certain amount of self-fulfillment, but I, I only remember in theory I did those things, but what burns bright in my mind, like right now, more than any of that stuff, is the fact that lit, quite literally, little Nora, who's seven, because the others are, you know, in older school now, I pick her up every day, my three or four hours with her at the end of the day and cooking for her and taking her out and playing and building her swing sets and reading out loud to her and watching her eat honey and bread when I read her Winnie the Pooh so she can be like Winnie the Pooh and organizing it so it's all there for her when she comes in after school is literally the highlight of my life. And nothing else, nothing else counts. And, and the same with my relationship with my wife, Jeannie. So yeah. the funny thing is the healing process you're talking about, you know, the sense of having earned something to get out of your own head, you know, the unearned part, the grace part that I still believe in spiritually, by the way, today, unrelated to any religious principle, but grace is the fact that people have arrived like the cavalry coming over the hill and saved me again and again. And they happen to be three-year-olds and two-year-olds and a, and a wife and a lover and a best friend. That's where all the meaning is. 
And that's why I've spent five and a half years trying to explain it in a new book coming out on November 2nd, because that's the big story of my life, not this stuff we're talking about. And I know we've just spent yeah. an hour talking about it and, I, and, and it isn't wasted. Yeah. But in fact, I've been really lucky because I've lived to a point to where what I genuinely care about most is the present moment of connection to the people I love and who love me. And what I read in their eyes is, is, is a certain amount of trust and love. And that kind of is the redemption. It's not yeah. theoretical to me. So that's a little more than I meant to say. No, th anyway. that's, I mean, this is, and I, I understand this intimately as much as I can, right? You've got a few years on me, but, but I, yeah. I, I, I understand what you're speaking about. And, and it comes down to, I mean, they see you as you would want to be seen, but yeah. it's also very much, they see you without all of that baggage. They see you yeah. for what you put into your days now, which is who you are now without the rest of it. Right. And so it's a question of, can you see yourself as they see you? Because that's, yeah. that's, that's where you really come into yeah. um, finding rhythm. But I think for my part, again, going back to trying to find some semblance of masculinity by doing you yeah. know, the Hemingway, freewheeling, hard yeah. drinking, traveling, all that sort of thing. I, I had done all of those things that would have done the checklist of like, well, you're a, you're a fucking man now, you know, yeah. you've escaped by hope by all of these things. But th my, the only time, let me put it a different, a different way. I feel most like a good man. Mm. And I feel I have attained some something close to healthy manhood mm. when I make my wife tea in the morning. Yeah, you're here. And this is this is the truth of it. Mm -hmm. This is what it comes down to. Yeah. And it's really sort of a thing of, you know, you can give me any award you want. You can sort of, uh, I can have a cover with, you know, the explosion or the yeah. big investigative piece on whatever it may be, uh, Aleppo or Afghanistan or blah, 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 blah. None of that makes me feel mm -hmm. um, truly um, like myself than when I am loving my wife well. Yeah. And this is, this is such an interesting um, thing in that in the, what we came from, Everything mm. is so towering and everything mm. is so large and everything is so in the, in the distance on the horizon and, yeah. you know, huge to be attained. But, mm. but the truth of the matter is real greatness lies in, in the minutes and seconds that we, um, the, the, the raw material of who we are comes mm. through in, in moments, in, in small things, yeah, absolutely. In, in, in places where no one is watching, where, where mm -hmm. you have, um, you have the ability to create who you are in that moment, yeah. even yeah. if it's just making tea in the morning, you yeah, know, or, or pausing to respond instead of react. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in many, many ways, I respect myself at a, at a much higher level when I'm loving my wife well mm -hmm. than when I'm given an award for something that I covered overseas. Yeah, and this is something I could it, like if I had tried to tell myself you would that not have 16, foreseen 17 this. Right. ever, ever. And I, I love it. It yeah. is it is it is um, there's real honor in that, I think. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, without getting too Oprah-esque here, I find that for <laughs> me, for instance, um, you know, whatever what this all boils down to is that. It, it, it's occurred to me, especially in the last 10 or 15 years of my life, that the fundamental problem of our culture is not political. It's that we have the wrong idea of what success is. We have to yeah. redefine the word. And success is the guy who loves his, his partner, his wife, his gay lover, his non-binary friend, brings her or they tea and finds total fulfillment in that moment. Um, that's a lot more an indication of a successful human being than having made half a trillion dollars so that you can buy your own spaceship. Yeah. And our, our cultural idea of success that defines us by career title, where we have women who are talking to me on this podcast because of my new book on family coming out, you know, the title's pretty much in your face, um, you know, fall in love, have children, stay put, save the planet. And by the way, I don't necessarily even mean literally have children biologically. 
but have people you care for. Yeah. Fall in love, I don't mean necessarily romantically. I mean, fall in love with something more than your fucking job. Okay. <laughs> Um, when I say, you know, stay put, I mean, don't just keep moving to chase more money. You're never going to have a, don't whine about not having community. You know, you just move for the 11th time because you wanted another pay raise. So it, it, I have, it's a very traditional title of quote, family values, but the message is that, you know, basically like right now, I'll give you an example of caregiving. You have been my mother for an hour because you have talked with me sympathetically and kindly, tried to bring something out of myself, told me that I can forgive myself a little bit for some things that have gone on, taken a little of the bit of the heat off me, that's caregiving. Now that's, that's an actual relationship role that we have in this conversation. So that's what the book is about. But what I'm trying to say is, is that it seems to me that both of us in our own ways have discovered something. And that is we have changed our idea of success. Yeah. So, so success yeah. to me is when Nora puts her hand into mine automatically now, I don't have to ask her if she trusts me. And, and on the way, you know, I walk her home every night and she says to me, Ba, tell me a going home story. Well, mm -hmm. it's a ritual. That's my most successful storytelling I've ever done. It isn't a novel. It isn't a book you can buy. It's Nora saying, Ba, tell me my going home story and all the security and happiness of that childhood that is encapsulated in that moment without even thinking about whether it's gonna happen or not. That's success. Yeah. Just like your wife getting that cup of tea, at that moment, you were a successful human being. And I really, you know, so you've done some things in journalism, big deal, I've written a couple of books, but if I talk to your wife and she told me a whole different story, or you talk to mine and she says, this is all bullshit, he's an asshole. <laughs> all that other shit doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And I'm afraid our culture doesn't get that. But it's, it's, it's interesting that I think there's so much there. This is the thing as well. I think, you know, uh, what you are for her, you know, I love Ba as well. That's yeah. the sweetest thing. But, you know, you are being for her, you know, if, if we could sort of look at a temporal, you know, fracture, let's say it's yeah. chronologically challenged and sort of like, you know, yeah. going back in time and seeing little you or little me, I, I know for my part that, um, you know, you can be for her what would have kept you in a place away from fear now, yeah. right? For my part, I think it's very much the case of, it's everyday magic, hmm. you know? And it's, it's, it's sort of the thing of, in the culture now, success, and I, I won't speak for women, I'll speak is in my experience as a man of its domineering, it's conquering, it's yeah. hustle culture, it's attaining, yeah. it's get ba 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 ba. But I mean, it, Tolkien has a beautiful line, right? Mm. Which is, he says, the hands of the king are the hands of the healer, and yeah. so shall the rightful king be known. Mm. And this is the thing, it's not about the great battle, it's about being in the houses of healing afterwards, where that's where true kingship comes through, mm. right? But even going to not having to know everything, not having to be on top all the time, not having to be constantly, because when we look at people and, and we perceive them as all knowing, mm. it's bullshit. It's not real. Yeah. It cannot be real. It yeah. cannot be real. And no trust can exist in that moment mm. because anyone putting that forward is a liar. Mm. And that's where sort of we come from. And yeah. it's really a case of, I was talking about sitting in the fear earlier, but sitting in doubt mm. as well. I think I'll pull from another library just, just because it pops up, which is Tennyson said, there is more uh, faith mm. in honest doubt than in all the creeds of man, yeah. right? Yeah. And this is something that um, rings in my head constantly because it is a case of when I am in a place of not knowing and when mm. I'm in, in a place of not being on top of the situation, I have to embrace that as the human experience because what we see politically to really just tie it all together in a clumsy way mm. what we see politically at the moment what we see in interpersonal conflict what we see all over the world is from people having the inability to sit with doubt and mm. fear and not freak the fuck out because right. and it's demand really certainty and demand certainty demanding certainty 
wherever it comes from. Mm. It's sort of a thing of, okay, well, you're saying that there are facts and truth over right. here, but we don't know how it sort of lines up with what I need for the human experience. And then this person over here says yeah. that he's found total truth and certainty and it's only 1999. Yeah. Hey, guess what? That's a fucking bargain. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it's really a thing of um, you know, being able to sit with each other in, in the dark of living. Yeah. And, and this is where loneliness and banishing loneliness comes into play, which is my, my, my focus and, and my mission as it is now yeah. to use the word as it's supposed to be is yeah. making people feel less lonely. And it's the emotional equivalent of lighting two cigarettes and passing one over to you, yeah. you know, yeah. that's what it, because we just need, we need to get through this thing called life and be good to each other in, in the process, mm. but also save people from harm from those who are not unknowing, but those who know yeah. and do it anyway. And yeah. it inflicts harm upon people. And Which so you've seen a lot of given the, the what you've been covering around the world. We're going to wrap this up, but let's have another conversation, Christian, if you're up for it sometime. Sure. Um, this is Frank Schaefer. You have been watching and or listening to my podcast in conversation with Frank Schaefer. And by the way, I'm participating in a porch course with Gareth Higgins, my friend who founded the Wild Goose Festival, September 26, based on my forthcoming book, Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy. Um, and nobody will be turned away for a lack of resources. There is something to pay, but if you can't afford it, you just say so, and it's free. Uh, please visit theporchcourses.com to become a part of this. And if you want to do me a personal favor, uh, pre-order my book so that the numbers go up on Amazon and somebody pays attention to it and it doesn't sink. Like some of my books do, like a rock thrown into a very deep pool <laughs> never to be seen again. Stephen, thank you. We will be talking more... Um, it's Christian, uh, by the way. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, now my, now my producer Ernie's laughing because I, I have to read <laughs> the title of my own book here because I can't remember it. Christian <laughs> Stephen, um, thank you so much and much love to you and your wife. I hope we can meet sometime uh, face to face and Likewise. keep doing this again. And thank you to Laura, Don, my friend who kind of introduced us. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. Talk soon.